thought I'd set the tone for this video by listening to the British National Anthem, which is very, very weird for me as an American because we kind of hijacked your National Anthem and turned it into a love song for America called My Country Tis of Thee. You may not know this, but I am of Irish descent, hence the somewhat red hair I have, and also English descent. So that's the two sides of my family. My mom's side is English, my dad's side is Irish. So my heritage goes back to the UK. So in my last few videos, we have been watching stuff on India and on China, and there's one recurring theme in all of those videos, and that is the British Empire. As an American, there is a certain fascination with British history because we have roots in it, obviously. And here in America, we did actually fight off the British Empire as well, along with apparently a lot of other countries around the world. Even so, I know nothing about the British Empire other than I've heard that it might have been like the biggest, most extensive empire ever in history, but I don't know. And I have seen the maps where the British Empire looks like it's conquered pretty much at least half of the world. I mean, holy moly, Britain. So this whole concept of the British Empire and this Western nation that America has roots in, going out and trying to conquer the entire world, I don't understand that mentality. I don't understand why they did it, where that was coming from. Was Britain just really hungry for power? Was it an economic thing, money thing? Or did the monarchs just simply have this desire to basically rule the world? So today we're going to be learning about the British Empire. Again, I know nothing about this, so this is going to be really interesting to learn kind of the extent of it, what maybe caused you know, them to go out and, and try to conquer everything. So let's see just how powerful the British Empire was. This video that we're going to watch is from the channel Knowledgeia, so go take a look at their channel. The link for this video is in the description, so let's go. Why are they singing about Spanish ladies? The British Empire may not have technically ruled the world, but it was, in fact, the largest empire to exist at any point throughout history. See, I was right. Reaching across the globe and carrying on over multiple centuries, the British Empire owes its success and ability to expand so widely. The geographical position... Um... I think, though, when they're talking about the most expansive empire in history is probably because it took over most of the known world. When it was big, we knew about pretty much the entire world at that point, whereas if you go back to maybe like the Mongols, for instance, they maybe conquered the most land proportionally for what we knew as the entire world back then. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say position of Great Britain served as a major advantage to the growing empire. Really? Given that the nation was an island, the likelihood of being invaded or conquered was somewhat mm. lower than a country that was okay. surrounded on all sides by That's foreign powers. true. Although Britain think about was that. not completely immune to incursions, it definitely benefited geographically, both in terms of external threats and when it came to any border disputes. We have that in common with Britain over here in America. Obviously, America also benefits from its geographic location being on the other side of the world, and then we are surrounded by oceans on both sides. And then we have Canada to the north, which is honestly not a threat for invading us. And then we have Mexico also, which we did have some skirmishes with in the past, but again, they're not really considered that much of a threat to us at all. So America is actually in a really safe place. You know, but then like 9-11 happened and then we realized that that's maybe not quite as true as it used to be. Disputes. Britain had a pretty clear and straightforward border between itself and any other nations. While Scotland and England split the landmass that was bilaterally united with the ascension of Scotland's King James VI to the throne of England in 1603, both states would together make up the nation of Great Britain by 1700. Wait, so a Scotland king took the throne of England? Did I watch that? Was that right? Scotland's King James VI to the throne of England in 1603 both states would together make up the nation yeah. of Great Britain by 1707. Okay. 
sharing their outward borders so that's with how nothing they but the North Atlantic Ocean and the North came Sea. Together. This open position with easy access for maritime expeditions okay. also gave Great Britain an upper hand when it came to reaching other countries and continents, needing only... So, according to that little map, that is Great Britain is Scotland, England, Wales, and Ireland, it looks like. ...to cross over foreign land when they wished to reach countries more inward on their continent. The Brits were able to sail to just about any coastal nation without much resistance. Still, oceanic adventures would not have been so effortless for the British Empire without a strong naval fleet. This is where the size and power of the Royal Navy became a center point of British success. Yeah. While Great Britain did not always so control the world's oceans, the reason they began to skyrocket as an unignorable maritime power by the 18th century is largely due to the fact that they invested more money in ships and guns than other naval forces. Get a parallel to the United States, we spend more on our military than any other country in the world, and it is the dominant military for that reason. Government and citizens of the British Empire truly believed that the future of their wealth was to be found through the ocean. Recognizing the importance of overseas trade, as well as a fleet okay. that could also defend their trade. land if ever required, the Brits made sure to adequately okay. fund the Royal Navy. The Empire's focus on trade additionally contributed vastly to its triumphant transcontinental growth. Intent mm -hmm. more on gaining wealth and increasing trade than on consolidating power through conquest, the Brits were able to create a more desirable environment for others to become a part of. After the six So their expansion was mostly because of trade, so economic reasons. And I may have misunderstood what he was saying, but it sounds like Great Britain was turning these foreign lands into a more favorable environment for people to live in because of the greater economic uh, and trade value that it was bringing. Okay, so, so most of this seems to be purely economic based and not this idea of just conquering lands for the sake of conquering and having power. The successful colonization attempts in North America and the West Indies during the 1600s, the British Empire began to establish a commercial system that allowed for exponential success within Great Britain and its overseas territories. Colonies were granted monopolies for their products in the British market, and therefore were to conduct trade via British ships. In 1651, the Navigation Act would prompt the development of a closed economy between the empire and its colonies. Mm. Yeah, so they're creating... like, they're like creating these monopolies, kind of like we have with these big uh, companies that we have today, like Google and Microsoft, uh, Amazon, you know, you just think of all of these huge companies that pretty much have a monopoly on their markets. So I'm, I'm getting that that's, that's what the British were doing here economically is that they were trying to make themselves as like the trade center of the world. So pretty much all countries had to go through them. Creating a system where all colonial imports were required to come from Great Britain and all colonial exports were to be sent directly to the yeah. British market. By the See, way, this is where British America ships. started having problems. During the same century, the British East India Company was established as a means of trade between Great Britain, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and India. Uh, we were we were touching on the East India Company in the Indian videos that I was reacting to or watching. It seemed like though that Britain included some military power behind it. Which I guess makes sense like if they're going to force these countries to abide by their trade and be that monopoly, then I would imagine that it would take some military backing in order to persuade these other countries to, um, to cooperate. Initially focused on the spice trade, the East India Company later incorporated other goods such as silk, cotton, tea, opium, and more. Politics mm -hmm. made its way into the company later on, despite the origin being purely based on establishing more trade opportunities. Okay. Driven limitlessly by the concept of controlling a global trade market, the British yep. Empire continued to extend its reach across the continents of Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and the Americas. 
while the process of colonization I mean, look at this map. It is so spread out. It's like, how did they know to go to these places? I guess they were in touch with all of these countries and kind of word of mouth travels. Hey, here's a good, good place to go and trade stuff. But how would they think to go to South Africa? I also just noticed that it says this is 1820 and we see that the British are no longer in the United States. So this video kind of glossed over that part of how we kind of kicked the British out and said, well, no, we're not going to trade with you exclusively anymore. And varied from territory to territory. One thing that remained consistent was the form in which these expeditions began. Unlike other empires who chose to expand through the use of military might and sovereign claims to power, the British facilitated most of their expansion through the establishment of trading posts and systems. Nonetheless, the British Empire was not a completely non-violent authority. On top of the yeah. Anglo-Dutch and Anglo-Spanish wars near the start of British expansion, the Empire also engaged in conflict with its American okay. colony I spoke during the soon. American Revolutionary War, later followed by the dissension in India, succeeding the decline of the Mughal Empire, and leaving the okay. British East India Company as a prominent political power in the region. The presence of Britain I did a video yesterday on the Mughal Empire. So if you haven't watched that video yet, uh, it was it was uh, really kind of fun learning about this period of of India's history. Um, it seemed like it took India at least a hundred years to get the British out of India, which seems like a really long time to me. So again, I don't know why it took so long. What was the difference? It took America like just a few years to get the British out. So it's a very different, um, different outcome. ...of Britain in India was also notably more forceful than some of their other trade-focused enclaves demonstrated by the expansion of the East India Company's power through the threat of violence against those who protested. Yeah. The continued tensions between the British and French were no longer secluded in India either, as the Seven Years' War erupted French. in 1750s. What does the French have to do with this? As the Seven Years' War erupted in 1756, lasting until the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, oh. leaving... I know nothing about the Seven Years' War, although I did learn about it in history. Like, I, I remember having to learn about the Seven Years' War, but as with most things in school, you just don't remember it past the uh, time when you have to take the test for it, usually. Leaving Britain as the leading power across India and the world's oceans. When the American okay. Revolutionary War... Was that like the Napoleon era? Because I know Napoleon was uh, French and he had like a big navy and he battled with Britain so I'm guessing Britain conquered Napoleon? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm talking about. War came in 1775 after the British Empire responded to the no taxation without representation movement of the Americans by sending troops to try and subdue the colonies. France and Spain chose once again to go to war with Britain, now as allies of the newly declared United States. In 1783, yeah. at the Peace of Paris, the Common British enemy. Empire was forced to acknowledge American independence, in turn relinquishing any control over their former colonies. Devising a new strategy after such a drastic loss of territory, Great Britain now turned its attention toward the continents of Asia, Africa, and Australia, hmm. marketing what some historians call the beginning of the Second British Empire. Though really? trade between the United States- I've never heard of a Second British Empire before. Why is there that demarcation between the first and the second? Was there like a halt to it at some point? And then they kind of started again? Or is it just simply two different kinds of eras of the British Empire? Are we going to start seeing the British Empire turn a little bit more violent at this point? United States and Great Britain actually continued after the installation of independence. The Empire chose to utilize the uncolonized coasts of Australia, which had been discovered by a Dutch explorer, Willem Janszoon, in 16... This would be interesting to learn about is how Australia was discovered and colonized. Because again, this is something I, I don't know anything about also. ...and later claimed for the British crown by James Cook in 1770. Yeah, under the yeah, yeah, yeah. James Cook is a famous name um, that we 
do learn about in American history. I don't know if he did anything having to do with America, but he is a uh, very f familiar name to me that we definitely learned about. For the name of New South Wales, still feeding their okay. fresh craving for expansion in South Asia. I love how all of these places have taken on British names. New South Wales, New York, New Hampshire. Is there a Hampshire in England somewhere? Norfolk. We have a lot of things named after Britain as well. I'm assuming Australia probably does. South Asia. The British suddenly engaged in a series of conflicts after the Battle of Plassey, which had occurred in 1757. By 1774, the British Empire took on a chain of attacks. The anglo missor Wars were fought until 1799, followed by- Okay, so they're doing all of this in, 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 uh, in India. At the same time, they are fighting us over in America. So the British have wars going on in multiple areas at the same time. That's kind of impressive, because if you're an empire, you definitely have to be able to do that. Followed by clashes with the Pindaris. Attacks on places like Sindh and Burma also accelerated the new consolidation efforts of the British East India Company. On top of what was referred to as the Doctrine Lapse, where the Brits forbid... I just noticed that this graphic has a cross on top of it. What's the deal with that? Is there some religious element going on here that I'm not sure of? Are the British trying to ex like spread Christianity in these areas that don't really have Christianity? Bid the ascension to the throne of any Hindu ruler if they were not the natural heir. Once the current Hindu leader either died or was removed in some way, the British would occupy his state and gain control. These acts mm. by the British Empire, combined with other forms of forced westernization of the Hindus, led to the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857. To okay, so we are seeing a turn from just pure economics into actual like conquering for the sake of conquering and power. So I can maybe see why there is a second British Empire. To 1859. Tired of the current heavy-handed British rule, the Indian troops of Meru sparked a rebellion that would spread throughout the nation. Peace was finally declared in July of 1859, and the British East India Company was scrapped. Although the empire maintained a level of control under the crown until yeah. 1947. I was gonna say, During yeah. this span of time, Great Britain set about making its presence better known in Africa as well. Although the Royal African okay. Company had been established back in the 17th century, finding ample profit... So they just, like... The, the British just formed these companies in all of these continents. Did they do that in, in the United States, too? I can't remember. I'm trying to think back to, like, revolutionary history here in the U.S. If there was a uh, British company, maybe it was, like, a tea company or something like that. It seems like there was something like that. Profit in the slave trade until its abolition in 1807. Oh wait, it was profit in the company had been established back in the 17th century, finding ample profit in the slave trade until its abolition in 1807. Oh, it was geez. not. So Britain just basically started doing the slave trade for economic reasons, like they just wanted money. I mean, I guess economically it makes sense because back then, I mean, really throughout the entire course of human history, slaves have been a thing, you know? And it was still kind of going on at this time in, in a lot of different cultures. And so Britain saw an opportunity, another economic opportunity, to trade people in addition to trading goods. You know, it's just a different mindset back then. Obviously, we can look back on that and think about how horrible and evil that is. And really it is. But at that time, a lot of people didn't see it that way. You know, slavery, again, like I said, had been a thing throughout the entire course of human history. And so it was kind of like a normal part of life. And it was just kind of accepted that some people were slaves, which is really backwards thinking to us today. And I'm glad that humanity, or at least the West and most of the world, have recognized slavery for what it is. But I know it still goes on in certain parts of the world, which is a shame. Hopefully one day we can completely eradicate it because everybody should have equal opportunity in life. 
It's not until the 19th century that the Brits realized the potential benefit of forming a trade route across Africa. With its eyes set on establishing outposts spanning from Egypt down to the southern half of the continent, the British Empire found itself in a race against the other growing European powers, such as Italy and Germany, which really? eventually led to the Berlin Conference. The okay, cons so other European countries were starting to kind of try to get in on some of the action here. Okay, what, what year is it? This looks like it's going into the late 1800s, maybe early 1900s. The conference, which occurred in 1884, okay. was intended right. to create some harmony between the competing colonizers. Great huh. Britain was ultimately awarded most of northeastern Africa and all of southern Africa, meaning that at its peak in the continent, the British Empire ruled over approximately 30% of the African population. Globally, wow. at the height of Britain's domination, it controlled roughly 22 to 25 percent of the world's land surface. Obviously, that's going to beat out any ancient empire that was more contained to just a certain region of the world. But proportionally speaking, was it still like considered the biggest, or is this just pure landmass? And by 1938, governed around 20 percent of the world's population. This remarkable prosperity was accomplished through a geographical advantage, supreme naval might, and the strategic focus on trade and wealth over bullish sovereign power for the sake of an emperor. I'm assuming this is like an old English patriotic or naval song or something. All right, well, I feel like I just learned a ton about world history and the British Empire throughout these videos that I've been watching has been really bugging me because it keeps coming up and I didn't know anything about it. So now I'm glad to know a little bit more about why they decided to go to these foreign lands. We learned that it was an economic and a trade-based reason, which is good because I was hoping that it wasn't going to be because they had this mindset that they wanted to conquer and invade all of these countries, kind of like we saw with a lot of the um, other like ancient cultures that they would just conquer and invade for the sake of conquering and invading. However, it seems like the Second British Empire kind of took more of that mindset and got involved in the slave trade, which prompted America to kind of also get involved. These days, it's America that's kind of the equivalent of what the British Empire used to be, although I feel like we're kind of in areas of the world for slightly different reasons. And depending on what that reason is and where you are in the world, you either love America or hate America. So maybe we'll do some more exploring on that subject in future videos. Let me know in the comments if you can answer any of my questions in this video. I'm always game to learn from you guys. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I would certainly appreciate it. We'll, uh, we'll come back for something new tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and we'll see you later. Thank <laughs> you.